Good morning, everyone. So a few years ago, a friend of mine who had migrated from the US from Hungary, and it was the early 1990s, made the following statement in relation to domestic work. She said, most girls do this work because they don't have many options. You can either be a nanny, clean homes, work in a restaurant, or be a stripper. If I had received my green card years ago, I probably wouldn't be doing this work anymore. But when you do it for so long, other types of jobs close up. You get no experience doing anything else. You get stuck. In this quote, my friend Zhuzha was referring to the anti-immigrant sentiment of the early to mid-1990s, which not only resulted in passage of laws that made living conditions even more deplorable for undocumented immigrants, such as, for example, Proposition 187, which denied health care, education, and other public services to immigrants and their children. They also made it more difficult for household workers like Zhuzha to gain lawful and permanent status in the US and, more, and move out of the domestic work sector. While passage of laws like the Illegal Immigration Reform and Responsibility, Responsibility Act of, of 1996 cre uh, was created to curtail US immigration by making it even more difficult for applicants to adjust their, their status, for those of us working in this sector, these restrictions were experienced as legislative efforts to secure cheap and exploitable labor. We all felt stuck. After working in homes for, in New York City for two decades, I became interested in the everyday workplace dynamics that these laws permitted and the conditions that are specific to the domestic work situation com common among workers laboring in the industry. Some of these included the experience of extreme isolation, intense fear through the enforcement of trivial demands by employers, instances of degradation, fluctuation, fluctuating labor expectations, and a loss of autonomy through surveillance, control of the body, and a maternalistic relationship. These on-the-ground dynamics occur within the context of a globalized market which impact the characteristics and experiences of the workforce. Addressing this influence, as well as the similarities and differences between the globalization of domestic work and other transnational circuits of labor, is the following panel, Labor Migration and the Transnational Demand for Domestic Labor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, can you hear me? Great. Okay. I have the honor of um, chairing this panel, um, and I would say it's trem a tremendous honor to be here, especially with all of you out there um, in the room, uh, many of whom I would like to sort of uh, call upon later on. Um, but um, right now, I want to say that I have the not so dubious distinction, uh, or other dubious distinction, of um, having to limit. Um, our remarks to approximately seven minutes, I think is what we, what we calculated. So um, we're gonna do our best to do that, including myself. Um, and I'm going to go straight to, I think I'll, I'll save my remarks for the end so that I um, can see how I need to modify things. <laughs> but, um, but so for the moment, I will uh, follow Linda Burnham's lead uh, last night and I won't bother to introduce um, people who are likely very well known to you already. Um, and I will ask you to just look at your program um, if you need any more details. Um, and I will just sort of outline um, what each uh, panelist is going to address, and then um, we'll let people just take charge. So uh, Saskia Sassen is going to address, uh, she's basically going to set the context for us for how globalization drives both the supply and demand and transnational circuits of labor within the domestic work industry. Um, Rachel Prenius is going to be talking about how ILO conventions and the state within both sending and receiving countries set policies that shape the conditions for domestic workers globally. Uh, Martina is going to be talking about how, um, globaliz how globalization has led to a continuum of abuse within domestic work and what justice strategies, of which she is a great part, um, and immigration remedies might be available to abused or trafficked workers. 
And uh, Tamara is going to be talking about um, looking at beyond the visible victories in legislation, such as the um, New York Bill of Rights uh, and other, um, other legislation in other states. Um, how can we see more everyday victories in the membership, in both terms of membership and um, legal cases on the ground? So Saskia uh, uh -oh. is going to begin, and then Rochelle, and then Martina and Tina. Well, um, it's great to be here. I must say, I came last evening to totally exciting. I came to New York, believe it or not, as an undocumented worker, and guess what my first job was? A domestic worker. Uh, it gave me an insight. The janitors of Wall Street and the domestic workers in New York City gave me an insight on one particular development that marked a difference. And that was the same tasks, cleaning, janitoring, childcare, whatever they may be, actually could happen in very diverse types of structural spaces. Now, the 1980s was a time when the global city phenomenon is happening. And what you really see is the building of a special strategic platform. And I started arguing then that those domestic workers, those janitors, who often occupy different worlds, by the way, huh, in these cities, janitors and domestic workers, but who worked in that particular new structural space that was part of a global operational space for very dominant economic sectors. Actually, yes, the tasks were the same as those who might be working in modest middle-class households or whatever, or just standard, you know, high income. And in that sense, they were workers maintaining a strategic economic platform in the same way that the lawyers and the accountants, et cetera, et cetera. And I argued at that point also that that, that gave a possibility for organizing. And I think it's quite interesting when you see where domestic workers' organizations have actually succeeded. And or same thing with justice for janitors. They have succeeded in certain critical spaces that matter enough that there is a kind of response. So I just want, that is my, I already, I have a clock. I used my two minutes to say that because uh, I moved on since then. And I will say that I was with a bunch of women who were mostly Colombian and, and Afro-Caribbean. None of us felt that whatever the job we were doing represented our full, our fullness, if you want, right? We all moved on. So I think that is also, I heard this morning the woman who talked, que respondiste a la hija, la cuestión de la hija, ¿verdad? Uh, so, anyhow, I think that that's very important. That, for me, it matters enormously. Now, one question that I was asked to address, what has and what hasn't changed in the United States demand for household work? Well, one thing that has changed is what I just mentioned, is that more and more janitors and domestic workers are working in a strategic sector. And that strategic sector needs them. I think that is a critical issue. You see that in Paris, you see that in London, you see it in Hong Kong, you see that in Dubai, you see it in a whole bunch. And, and the fact of the space where they work does matter. Um, now, at the same time, uh, of course, globalization, which I, by the way, think of something that gets in good part constituted inside national territory. It's not something that is out there. You know, the global city isn't, is an, uh, uh, a construction of a space within a city that is part of a global operational space for very powerful actors. Huh? So that actually has a shadow effect. And you see it through a variety of uh, legal options. For those of you who are aware, WTO mode four, which enables firms to bring in foreign workers, and they're granted full rights with one difference towards citizens, which is it's for a limited period, and they cannot run for political office. They are, of course, zero interested in running for political office because all they're worried about is profit making, right? But that has meant that because WTO mode four is quite cumbersome, that they are now bringing in, if they go for that mode, bringing in foreign professionals. They hire everybody else. 
a secondary derivative of that has been that you now have multinational corporations who guarantee the standardized domestic worker no matter where you go in the world because many of these professionals are continuously circulating. So it's not that they get, move them around, it's that they, they train <laughs> these domestic workers to deliver services in a certain standardized mode. Whether that is good or bad, I don't know. I still have to sort that out. My question is, is there a politics that is possible insofar as these multinationals are, whether they know it or not, constructing a platform that is multi-sited globally. Global never means the whole world, by the way. Yeah? It's a very strategic geography we're talking about. So again, there I see something quite interesting. Now, conditions promoting migrations, and, how, and, and for me that, that is an important subject, but at the same time I always am very keen on capturing how the migrants themselves constitute their migrations. And there is enormous variability. In other words, both the conditions that promote migration, and maybe I develop that a bit more when you do the questions, and how the migrants constitute their migration process and project. That, I think, is, and there are anthropologists, you know, anybody who does ethnographies have produced extraordinary, uh, Rassel is one of them. Uh, so that is a whole world that needs to be brought into the picture because then you capture the complexity of these human beings. My experience has been, as I go around the world, often also to refugee camps and things like that, displaced people's camps, as they call them. Their intelligence is just like ours. They are fully aware of their surroundings. They know what made the process that got them where they are. And often they are agents, of course, of that process, but often not. So to me, the, 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 so having said that, let me just list a few items that I think matter. The outsourcing of jobs has, in my reading of the evidence, uh, produced bridges that migrants then also travel. The most, the, the, the most familiar example is probably the maquilas. The maquilas in the, in the you know, south of the border with Mexico brought in workers from the interior of Mexico. Once they were there, they jumped borders, so to say, but also with other countries. And, and I have been very interested in how our military operations whether that is invading the Dominican Republic way back when in the 1960s because they had voted, went to a good working voting system, a socialist, Bosch, some of you may remember that. Then the Green Berets went in there and, uh, and that built a bridge for middle class Dominicans to start coming. You know? So I just mentioned that as one example. There are many such examples. So when I think about what we call in-migration, I see a process that is partly generated by what we call the receiving country. And that then leads me to another issue that is on the agenda now, but it's buried, I would say, which is that in our law, the immigrant has to demonstrate the validity of her claim to come in. Not if you're a professional, by the way, then it's sort of de facto, but if you are going to be in a sort of a, what we might describe as a low wage labor market. And out of the picture is left all the, you know, the invasions, the corporate use of those countries of origin. So it is a two-way uh, street, really. And we recognize it only with officially declared refugees. We know that when we went to war to Vietnam, we produced a migration. Uh, but I think we should push for that also with the immigrant condition. Now, I would say that if there is one major event that has happened in the last few years that has altered the pattern of conditions that produce migration, it is traffic. Trafficking has become an absolutely dominant event. And it is not just little obscure trafficking networks. When the World Bank develops a big tourist center to, to promote economic development in a given country, the traffickers are there right away. So these are major, we, I think there's a lot of data, probably many people know this, but I would say that 
if there is one issue that has made a difference, it is trafficking. And that has represented a severe degrading. Now, I would also like to position trafficking in a broader economic space. And I will conclude with that so that I don't use up too much time here. And that is that in our current global economic system, it is the intermediary sectors that have the highest growth rates. So again, I would like to put trafficking right there with high finance, right there with a whole bunch of fancy, fancy, super fancy and creative accountants and lawyers. They cannot lose. They may make you know, arrangements between two, two, the two firms may go down, they come out with money. And we have seen that with the financial system. So that my, my push has long been in my research to position elements that are critical vectors in a given process in this larger space so that it is not just some sort of obscure world of powerless people. It is a much it's very much a constitutive element. And it, in other words, what I'm also saying is that the ascendance of trafficking reflects also the ascendance of that intermediary sector in our global economy. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the organizers for um, in inviting me. It's really an honor to, to speak in this panel and also to be just invited among this group of very esteemed um, domestic worker scholars that I've been really influenced by. And so I was asked to really talk generally about the state and domestic work. And uh, I'm going to draw from my research um, in Dubai and Singapore that's ongoing. So I want to um, give a shout out to my research partner, Rachel Sylvie, um, over there. Um, and so this is drawing from our research together. And so what Rachel and I are looking at is this condition of sponsored migration. And so um, most migrants in the world globally today are not free workers. Instead, they're contract workers. And as contract workers, their visa or their residency in the receiving country is tied to a particular sponsor. And that the degree of ability to get out of that relationship is, you know, flex, it it's, varies from country to country. And so while all migrant workers, including, for example, um, agricultural and construction workers, are also in this relationship, what is particular about domestic workers is their live-in requirement. And so this live-in requirement sort of aggravates their vulnerability and dependency and relationship of inequality with their sponsors. And so this um, condition of sponsored migration you know, is pretty universal, but it um, emerges, um, it, it looks differently in different countries. And so um, it, it's also the case in Italy. So you basically have two extremes here, and I've basically looked at both extremes. So my first study was on the US and Italy and just speaking about Italy. So in Italy, they also have the sponsored migration system, but what is particular about Italy is that there is no live-in requirement. And then what's also different about Italy is that while you have the sponsored, um, the sponsor who you're working for, you are not constrained to only working, working for that sponsor. So in all these other countries like Singapore, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, you um, have to work for that just one employer and you have to live with that employer. And so um, Rachel and I are looking at Dubai and Singapore because this is probably the other extreme from Italy because in Dubai or the UAE, in Singapore, you cannot leave that relationship without your employer's permission. So it really aggravates this relationship of inequality. And so what our research is doing is we're looking at this gray area between what you can say is free migration. It's like when you migrate somewhere and you can just choose your employer, you quit when you want to quit versus um, so this gray area between that and human trafficking and quote unquote slavery. So we refuse to really reduce this condition to trafficking and we refuse to reduce this condition to slavery. And it's because it's like their children are owned by these, their employers, for example. They can quit if they want to quit and you know, not have a job. But I think most significantly is that, and this is sort of the conundrum, is that women want to put themselves in this situation. They are fully aware that this is what they're going to face and yet they put themselves in this situation. So they weren't really duped and told, you know, you're going to go there and you're going to be a free worker. I mean, they kind of know what they're going to get into. So then speaking about, um, so what happens to them? Then, so I want to just get into the conditions in Dubai and then sticking with this theme of the state. And so Dubai is um, kind of a weird place because it's a feudal capitalist state, right? So there's no elections, um, but it's a capitalist state. And so then how do they keep their people happy and content without the right to vote? And so what they have is what kind of calls a ruling bargain. And so basically what the state does is it gives all these benefits to Emiratis. 
it's like free schooling, free health, free housing, like free anything, and all this money that you want, and they don't pay taxes. And so then this um, right or this you know, privilege of the ruling bargain extends to the relationship with domestic <coughs> workers. And, and, and what Rachel and I argue is that it actually lends itself to what we call legal absolution. So what ends up happening is if a domestic worker is abused by an Emirati, what they do is they keep on delaying the court case until the domestic worker gives up. Because then the domestic worker, while this court case is pending, cannot work. So they're really just sort of just in this liminal space. But something kind of monumental happened this year, which was, it was for the first time an Emirati was actually prosecuted for their abuse of an Ethiopian domestic worker. And so something is going on that's different there, and that's what Rachel and I are exploring. So another good thing is that the majority of employers are not Emirati, and so then the majority of employers don't have this access to this legal absolution. So, um, so what it, then it raises this question, well, what are the conditions of employment in Dubai, you know? And so um, Rachel's doing the work on, Indonesians, and I'm doing the interviews with Filipinos. And so far, I've interviewed um, 72 Filipino domestic workers, and I've interviewed a variety of them, including people with a day off and without a day off, people who work for a variety of employers, people for, who work for rich employers and poor employers, um, documented and undocumented. And so from, gathering from my data, there's really four conditions of employment there. So the first is um, you're probably going to be underpaid. Um, so the average salary um, there for Filipinos is 220 to 275 US dollars a month. That's the highest. The lowest um, go to the Bangladeshis, which get on average 165 US dollars a month. So it might be a surprise for some people that there are Bangladeshis here because in 2003, Nana Oishi told us that Bangladeshi women were not allowed to migrate, but actually that's no longer true. Since 2009, they've been allowed to migrate and that there are about 30,000 um, domestic workers from Bangladesh in, um, in the UAE. And so what determines the sort of salary difference? It's, the English language speaking skills, but we also found it's really the um, level of modernity of the country. So if domestic workers know how to use a vacuum cleaner, a rice cooker, a food processor, that sort of like determines their wages. Um, secondly is that you're likely to be overworked, so you're going to likely to work 18 hours a day, and, um, and you do what it's called all-around uh, employment. Um, a third condition is that you're probably going to not eat that much, and so there's like three groups of domestic workers there. There's one who like are subjected to limited food intake, with the worst being they only eat one meal a day. And so some women who I've interviewed who face that situation when they told their employers, I need to eat more than one meal a day, especially because my job is so strenuous, they're told dogs only eat one meal a day, um, so you can just survive in water. I mean, so it's pretty bad um, there. But a second group is the people who um, subject them to forced assimilation, which is basically you eat what your employers eat. And so this is basically like it's great if they're, they're Lebanese and they eat Lebanese food, which is good, but it's a problem if they only eat spicy Indian food. Um, and then the third group is that the people who eat with dignity. So there are some people who eat what they want to eat there. Um, and then um, uh, third, uh, fourth condition is that you're probably going to have limited freedom. Um, and so you're probably not going to have access to the phone, you're not going to have access to the internet, so just drawing from Singapore, for example, it's like very common there for domestics not to have access to their cell phone, and it's given to them like this, they're this kid at 7 p.m. because it's supposedly going to disrupt their work if they have their cell phone. Um, and then they're also unlikely to have a day off. And, um, but however, there were changes. In January 2013, um, Singapore finally mandated the day off. And in January 2015 is when the UAE is going to mandate the day off. So we're going to see what's um, going to happen there. And so then um, I want to end then with this discussion of what is the Philippine state's accountability and relationship to this situation, which is pretty grave. Um, and so uh, the Philippines is considered a model state. It's tried, it's other co receiving, con uh, sending countries try to emulate uh, what the Philippines is doing. I mean, so the, in the literature, the Philippine state has sort of been um, just depicted, and I agree with Jennifer Klein, what she was saying this morning, as this sort of static, unitary entity, like this like singular force. And that's really not what the state is. And, and it's, it's really a complex institution. Um, I would use what my um, co colleague, Danny Lehner Voss, would say it's, a, it's an organizational accomplishment. And so the problem for the Philippines is that they have all these workers who want to go to these countries where the conditions are so dire and terrible. Um, so then the problem is, well, how do they protect them? What do they do about this, right? And so um, how do they uh, make sure that standards of labor of the Philippines are met and also that the human rights of these workers are recognized? And so the state is sort of this complicated organization that tries to do things, but it backfires in them, so it's almost like they're just doing, you know, it's like they're doing things, and it's just kind of this 
insane process that they're going through. And so then, um, the thing about the state too is that they're forced to become an advocate of their people because a place like the United Arab Emirates, there is no civic engagement allowed. So you cannot have an organization like the National Domestic Worker Alliance there, it's totally illegal. And they're against that, not because they're against domestic workers, but they're afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so any kind of civic engagement, 12 people sitting together makes them nervous. So what does the Philippines do about this then? So I'm gonna end here by sort of just enumerating some. So then what, one thing they do is they try to mandate, they do mandate the use of recruitment agencies, supposedly to protect their workers, but the problem is the recruitment agency has conflicting interests. They have the interest of their profit, they also have the interest of the employer who they also represent, and then they supposedly represent the domestic worker. And so then that doesn't really work to the advantage of the domestic worker. Um, a second thing is that, you know, that they try to do is they try to ban tourist visas. And so one thing supposedly is like domestic workers try to bypass recruitment agencies by just going directly to the country and finding a job there. And then they say that those women who do that supposedly become susceptible to human trafficking. But the problem, however, is that then you're just limiting the freedom of people to move. You're, you're basically banning people, particularly women, to move. Um, and so then um, for them, it's like why they really want to do that, particularly in the Middle East, is because in the Middle East, about 15% of Filipinos are domestic workers, but um, they're 95% of the problem of the state there. And so then another thing that they do that's really interesting is that they do what you call a pre-migration seminar. Um, so the pre-migration seminar is like, you know, you go there and it's like all these domestic workers that are about to be deployed. So what are they told? They're told those four conditions that I told you. I mean, they're told like, um, you're probably not going to have, the, you're not probably going to have it, you're probably not going to have a day off and you're going to be lonely and you're going to look out the window, but don't jump out of the window. You don't have wings and people are, <laughs> people in the Philippines need your money, so don't jump out the window. Oh, in Saudi Arabia, you're going to eat a lot of chickens. Chickens in Saudi Arabia are really big, but... You're not going to eat the thighs and you're not going to eat the breasts. You're going to eat the head, the neck, the wings, and the butt. I mean, they literally told them that. You're going to work night and day, and then they make them chant, I'm going to work night and day. What? I mean, it, it was insane, like this pre-orientation seminar. But at the end of the day, those four conditions, I told you, they were being told these conditions, yet they still go, right? And so I can get into why do they still go um, later. And so then um, another thing that states do is they just ban the migration of the people. And so, for example, Indonesia, just banned all domestic workers from going to the UAE. Um, you know, and I can talk about what's that doing um, later if you want to know. And then lastly, I just want to talk about, um, you know, that the state tries to create and enforce standards of employment and really have to thank Convention 189 for this. And since Convention 189, a lot of receiving states have really used that to try to implement greater standards for domestic workers in um, around the world. And so in the Philippines, um, the Philippines, what they they've implemented is this $400 minimum wage. And so when I first went to Dubai, everyone kept on saying, well, I, my, I, my employer's nice, but I don't get the minimum wage, which was really surprising to me because the UAE and Singapore do not have a minimum wage in their laws. So I didn't know what minimum wage they were talking about. And so then I realized that it was this $400 minimum wage that the Philippines have really fought for. And for me, that was really interesting that it was something that the women aspired for. It was a standard that women started using against that 220 to 265 US dollar prevailing wage. And it was something that they used when they negotiated for that second contract when their employers tried to renew them. And so, um, yeah, so I just wanna end there and, and just wanna say then that you know, the relationship of the receiving state to the women um, are, are much more complicated than what we've sort of been presented with in the literature and that, but, the, the receiving state ends up being the biggest advocate of these domestic workers who are the most vulnerable um, to, to human trafficking, um, to labor trafficking um, today. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. It's wonderful to be on this panel. It's particularly wonderful because if you look at the panel, one of these things is not like the other. I am not an academic, I'm actually an attorney. And so it's wonderful to be in an academic conference uh, as, a, as a lawyer. I lived in Russia for years. One of my favorite words that I learned in Russian was konkretna, which means concrete. I was delighted to see that the, the title of this conference is Justice in the Home, but what I want to talk to you today about is justice in the courts. Because what we need to see, and several of the panelists in the first panel mentioned it, what we need to see is enforcement of the law. And although I come to you today as a trafficking lawyer, I would actually argue that the moral panic of human trafficking has actually obscured 
what is a continuum of labor violations, labor abuses across the board, where everyone is focused like a laser beam on trafficking and forgetting wage theft, forgetting long hours without overtime, forgetting the sort of everyday normal exploitation that is domestic work in the United States. And so one problem that we see in the United States is that it's very easy for us to find lawyers to represent human trafficking victims. Uh, I run an organization called HT Pro Bono, and all we do is train lawyers to represent trafficking victims and to bring federal cases against traffickers in court in the United States. It is well nigh impossible to find lawyers to represent victims of just regular garden variety labor abuses. Pro bono attorneys don't do that. And so what we have is a massive gap between those who are most abused, those on the far end of the spectrum who are held in situations of trafficking, and frankly, those are the clients that I by and large deal with. But we have a huge swath of the population that is completely ignored and frankly fortunate if they are able to find a lawyer who will even do their case on a contingency. Because from the perspective of the lawyers, the amounts are too small to actually bother doing the case. In the human trafficking movement, just looking at that, the worst abuses. In the human trafficking movement, there has been in the United States a sense that what we owe to trafficking victims is an immigration lawyer. Immigration lawyers are fabulous, but immigration lawyers do not actually fight for restitution. What immigration lawyers fight for is documentation. And so we have a history now of giving people T visas, trafficking visas, visas that are only available for people who are victims of human trafficking in the United States. Forget all the other labor violations. Uh, as Denise Brennan, an anthropologist, has pointed out, there are people who are just not abused enough to actually get any kind of immigration relief. But even speaking about the people who are abused just enough to get T visas, what we have done in this structure that we have built is create a system where someone gets a visa and nothing else. And a visa and nothing else is not enough. So we have trafficking survivors who've gone through a criminal case prosecuting a trafficker who at the end of the day end up in a situation of labor exploitation, right? Maybe not trafficking the second time around, but they are still in the same condition of vulnerability as they were when they started. And so the exploitation <coughs> rapidly follows on the heels of the trafficking. For those of us in the legal community who are fighting on behalf of domestic workers who have been trafficked, what we are fighting for is justice in the courts. And by that, I mean criminal restitution and civil damages awards. Because as one of my board members said, you know, sexual harassment was ubiquitous in the United States until victims of sexual harassment started filing lawsuits and those abuses started to have a cost. And so part of what we're trying to do as a systematic question is create accountability and create a cost to labor violations that rise to the level of trafficking. And frankly, I would love to see a cost for labor violations that rise to the level of labor abuse, right, that are on the bubble, not quite there. So the good news on the trafficking side is that although the moral panic of human trafficking has long focused on sex and trafficking to the sex industry, if you actually look at the case law, much of the case law is about domestic workers. So I'll just give you a hint of just a couple of the cases that are on the books that were brought by the Department of Justice. So one case, U.S. versus Kalimlim, was a case of a woman brought from the Philippines and held in a home of two physicians for 19 years and paid nothing. None of the neighbors knew that she existed because she was not allowed out of the house. In that case, the prosecution boldly brought that case. And the two physicians ended up with a sentence of four years each. On the flip side, the prosecutor in that case was quite excellent, and she managed to get restitution, which is mandatory in trafficking cases, and the restitution in that case was close to $900,000. Another case is U.S. versus Subnani. For those of you who are New Yorkers, you know, may know about this case. It was a very, very uh, well-covered case in the New York press about a couple 
multimillionaires who brought domestic workers from Indonesia, held them in their home, paid them nothing, and subjected them to severe violence and abuse. In the Subnani case, because those trafficking victims had lawyers, that case also ended in criminal convictions, and it ended in a restitution order after it was sent up on appeal, the restitution order was more than $600,000 for these two Indonesian workers. Domestic workers who are brought in from abroad, who migrate to the United States, many believing that they will be in legal jobs, earning legal wages, who then become trafficked, need more than just a T visa. They need a T visa and what I call a nest egg. Mm -hmm. Because you need to be able to rebuild your life. You have to be able to start over. The unfortunate news is that the US government brings very few of these cases. If you look at the balance of how many cases are brought, we just finished a five-year study looking at what prosecutions are brought by the Department of Justice. We found 306 indictments over a four-year period, of which 28 were for forced labor. The rest were sex. Two of them were for both. Sometimes you have a mixture. So only about 10% of the cases are actually for forced labor. There is under prosecution in this area. But what we also see is that many of those domestic worker forced labor cases are brought and what I call undercharged. So they are brought as alien harboring cases, right? They're not brought even as trafficking cases. So what happens when a trafficking victim who is a domestic worker can't get the US government to bring the case? Because frankly, the states never bring these cases. Your only hope is a federal prosecution at this stage. So what happens when there is no prosecution? Well, we see this quite a lot in Washington, DC and New York because many of the domestic cases that we have, domestic workers' cases that we have, are individuals who've been trafficked by diplomats. And those victims have zero chance of a prosecution, unless Preet Bharara is going to pick up your case, as he did in U.S. versus Coburgati. Um, Preet Bharara, we can, hats off to him. Yeah. Nevertheless, around the country, by and large, there is real reluctance to prosecute diplomats. But similarly, the pro bono legal bar has sort of jumped into the fray in the absence of prosecutions and brought cases. So again, another example. Uh, Mazengo versus Mazengi, a case against a Tanzanian diplomat in Washington, D.C., who held a woman in his home for four years, never paid her, refused mm -hmm. to let her leave the house, took her passport away. Standard garden variety human trafficking mm -hmm. case. Uh, that case was brought in federal court in Washington, D.C., and there was a million dollar verdict. Uh, another case uh, involving an American diplomat called Doe versus Howard, because now what we're doing is suing on behalf of domestic workers uh, as Jane Doe so that their families Very good. don't know yeah. that they've mm -hmm. brought suits. This is particularly important when there's, secre when there's extreme levels of uh, sexual violence in the home, which happens actually quite frequently. Uh, in Doe versus Howard, uh, we managed to obtain a $3.3 million judgment. Right? So these judgments, which look lovely on paper, are not always enforceable. I'll put that on the table. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to fight to create some sort of economic cost, increase the economic burden for those who are Willing to, willing to traffic individuals. So I just want to end with one piece of good news in a field where there is not much. <laughs> the one piece of good news is that although the Department of Justice less frequently brings forced labor cases, mm -hmm. and only a fraction of those, of course, are domestic labor, uh, domestic worker cases, uh, in a report that we just published, and I'm happy to sort of share the report with you, uh, about mandatory restitution in criminal trafficking cases in the United States, what we discovered is that Ironically, counterintuitively, those who are trafficked into domestic work, those who are trafficked into forced labor, rather than into work in the sex industry, are about four to five times more likely to get restitution than those in the sex industry. And so while those, while those cases are less frequent, the outcomes and the restitution orders are actually far, far better. So my question for all of you is how do we take the focus off of just trafficking? How do we bring the discussion of labor back to mm -hmm. the table so that we're not just looking at the worst forms of abuse, but that we're also looking at garden variety, vanilla mm -hmm. exploitation? Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, just out of curiosity, I'm going to mix things up a little bit here. How many academics are here in the room today or want to be academics? Okay, I'm not talking to any of you today, okay? <laughs> no. All right. Um, 
I want to talk to you very frankly today. I'm not going to use any academic mumble jumble, well, maybe a little bit, but I, I'm sure you'll understand it. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is getting back to the grassroots of everything that we're trying to accomplish with uh, domestic work specifically. I wrote a book called Raising Brooklyn about Caribbean nannies, uh, how they use public and private spaces, how they use specifically public spaces in order to create community amongst themselves in order to get through the monotonous day of taking care of children. Anyone with children knows how monotonous it gets. Um, but I want to talk to you because a lot of our focus today, especially on this panel and almost every single domestic worker panel I've ever been on, has been about structure. Um, and really looking at today transnational structure. I want us to get back to agency and start talking about the free will of the domestic workers and how do we integrate that with structure. Um, I have a little bit of a bone to pick and, and it's not against anybody here in the room, but I've been on several of these panels now and we have a lot of great ideas. We are smart people in this room. My concern is that we have yet to rally the troops and get them to the fore so that they do come to lawyers and exercise their personal rights. So I have an issue with the fact that we are here and we keep talking to each other. I know all, well, I know many of you here in this room and we keep talking to each other and that's wonderful. And we teach this stuff and that is wonderful as well. A lot of us do write white papers and those go to organizations that are doing what they can um, in order to move our, our plight forward. But at the end of the day, what we're not seeing moving forward, and I'm speaking specifically of New York City now with the Bill of Rights, or New York State with the Bill of Rights that we have for domestic workers in place, we are not seeing the membership come to the fore and asserting their rights in the numbers that they should be. If we're talking about a membership at DWU, and this is years ago, of 1,000, when we know full well that there are 250,000 of them here, what are we doing with that discrepancy? Why are we not talking about the discrepancy in those numbers? So, so my, my bone is that we look so much at structure, we start to lose sight of agency, and somehow we need to meet in the middle. Okay, so that's my bone. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so what I want us to also look at then is if we're looking structurally, how are we looking at structure as it's inhabited by the workers themselves? And then how are they moving across spaces with this structure inside of them? And then how do we break them free so that they can come to the fore and start asserting their rights? So, um, you know, I, I'm reminded of a, a domestic worker that I interviewed for my book who said, you know, we have slavery today, it just looks different, right? Um, it's, it's even more invisible today, I think, than it, than it ever has been before because it's frowned upon, uh, because we have laws that uh, make it uh, not popular. But as we can see and as we've heard on this panel, slavery definitely still exists. And so how do we break those chains? Um, that's my question. I see it here in this room today. I'm sorry, I apologize again. I'm not a popular girl today. Um, but I see stratification in this room today. I am not seeing the constituency that I interviewed here. I see some Caribbean women, yes, I see you. Um, but I'm not seeing the constituency that I would like to see in this room, the people who need to hear what's going on. And so, so again, where is the voice? And that's, that's my main concern. Um, I feel like the services are here. I feel in New York City specifically, the services are here. The law is here, the law is in place. The demand is here. However, the fear is here as well. And this is one of the key things that I found in my research is that domestic workers are steer, still very fearful of coming to the fore and asserting their rights. And so while we have lawyers who are gonna do pro bono work for us, who have the systems in place, who have been successful in articulating the cause and getting getting people to their rights, we still have this fear that lingers that is not allowing people to come forward. And so how do we allay those fears? That's my biggest question to everybody here today. Um, I feel that we have done a lot of work in the streets. I feel like we go to the parks, to these communities that I studied. We go, we hand out flyers, we tell them to come to our organizations and 
you know, let's talk about all of this. We have helping hands who are trying to do the same with employers, and we're trying to bring everybody together. Yet, we still do not have those numbers. And I want to ask you, as practitioners, not the academics, because academics, I know you're doing your thing, but the practitioners who are out here in the audience, what can we do to help you get the numbers? Because we need the information to get to the right people. But more than that, we need to allay the fears that are deep-rooted. I mean, workers want to come and assert their rights. However, a lot of them fear deportation. And while people might say that's a falsehood, they still fear it. It is real. It is concrete. And we need to somehow get across to these workers that those fears are real. Yes, we understand. However, here's what we can do for you. And I'm not sure that we are getting across that message to people in the way that it needs to be uh, brought forward. Um, as an academic, it's beautiful that I get to sit in my little office and I get to teach my students and I get to disseminate research to my colleagues. I feel like I'm not doing enough. I feel like I was on the ground with these women. I was able to hear their true fears. I was able to hear their stories. And that's all great and fine. And I'm talking to, I'm well, preaching to the choir, really, because that's who I end up talking to most of the time. And that's not my interest anymore. As I've moved away from domestic work research, that's no longer my interest. My interest now is what are we doing? What is the action that is being, that is being taken? What is it that we physically, intellectually, can do in order to bring structure and agency back together in the middle somehow. Um, even as I think about the organizations, and I'm not going to mention any of them because then I'm being in deep waters, um, but even the organizations that I think about who are trying their best to organize domestic workers, if we look at even the stratification within those organizations, if we even look at the dissension that has happened in those organizations, because I know it exists and people have told me and you might not want to hear it, but it's true. We have dissension among Caribbean domestic workers and Spanish-speaking domestic workers. One group may feel that they're not getting the same attention as another group within an organization. So again, how do we bring balance among these women so that they can now rise together and really bring to the fore what their true fears are, and then how do we allay those fears? So at the end of the day, that's my question. I've mentioned it at least 20 times, and as I tell my students, if I repeat anything three times or more, that's what I want you to take with you. And I've said it 20 times, but that's what I'd like to figure out with everybody here today through your Q&A today. Um, what is it that we can do? Because I'm sick of talking to academics, and I love you, but I'm honestly sick and tired of us talking in circles and circles about this. We know. We know what the information is. We have the information now. What are we doing with it? Thank you. Well, I'm incredibly impressed <laughs> that um, each of you uh, managed to convey so much um, in, in your, within your time frame. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, I want to just um, tag on to um, Tamara's comments uh, that I am very much interested in hearing more from uh, those of you out there. And I might even call, call you out <laughs> um, to speak a little bit um, because I recognize that there are so many experts in this room, and um, many, many, many of you did not take a seat up here, um, which, is, which is a problem, which is exactly what tomorrow is talking about. Um, and so I want to talk about some of those experts, and, and I want to say uh, just at the, at the outset that um, I'm sorry if I leave people out, because I will inevitably leave people out. I'm just going to talk um, about a few who I've been uh, lucky enough to, to meet. And so, the first is Lydia Edwards, who is going to be on um, the domestic worker organizing um, panel of emerging scholars um, in the afternoon. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting her, and we had a fantastic conversation um, by phone as well as uh, in person um, about all kinds of issues. And I, and I am convinced that she's a genius of all trades. Um, and um, I think probably had a lot to say about some of the issues that were raised in the last panel. Um, and so I'm looking forward to talking to her more, but I think um, also I would love for you if you have a minute, <laughs> um, and I know you have to step out for a second and then come back, but um, to, to contribute to the, the Q&A. So um, that's the first. 
Um, and the second is, um, I don't know if Ajahn is in the room. Is Ajahn in here? Not yet? Okay. Okay, well, um, name dropping as it is, uh, <laughs> I knew Ajahn um, back um, uh, now 20 years ago um, at when she was still at CAV, um, which used to be Communities, communities Against Anti-Asian Violence and then just became CAV. Um, she was the director of the, or she began the Domestic Workers Project um, there. Um, and we all know um, where she is now. Um, not literally, of course. But um, one, of the, one of the interesting things uh, that came up in my conversation with her um, just about, uh, maybe this conversation was only about 10 years ago. Um, I asked her about the issue of trafficking and where does it, where does it figure within the organizing uh, work and, and the whole sphere of work that she was looking at. And she said, well, we tried to put it into our Bill of Rights. We tried to put it in the language into the New York uh, Domestic Workers Bill of Rights and they frankly told us to take it out. They said, take it out, it's not your issue. And it's not going to get you very far, we'll tell you that much. So, um, so they did. Um, and, and as you know, we can argue about strategy, uh, but she and I had a very interesting conversation um, following that about how it is absolutely our issue. It is absolutely a domestic worker issue. As we all know, um, trafficking uh, within the, the domestic worker industry far surpasses uh, the sex trafficking that um, everyone wants to talk about, legislators, media, everybody. Um, and so, you know, we recognized at that point, um, where is the ability to put that issue um, in the forefront where it belongs? Um, and so that brings me to the next group of people um, that I want to talk about. I've had the um, pleasure and honor of interviewing many of the um, members and organizers and leaders of um, Damayan. Um, you heard from uh, one of their one of their members and, and um, organizers last night, uh, Lydia. Um, and I've also um, spoken to quite a few of the organizers and the general court, uh, Linda Walakan, the general coordinator, um, Leah Obayas, who's here also. Um, campaign manager and um, and case um, case manager, um, campaign coordinator and case manager. And um, I just want to say a few words about um, the things that have come up in my conversations with them. Um, so Leah Bias knows very well that um, that trafficking cases exist within uh, the domestic worker industry, and as case manager has um, had to really negotiate and help people navigate what is the justice strategy that you are going to pursue. Um, there are no promises, right, as, as Martina knows for sure. Um, and, you know, what, what is it that you want to attempt at least, right? Um, and so as, as a case manager has, um, has been able to help people navigate that very difficult question and process. Um, and as if that's not enough to do, um, is also a campaign manager and, and has, um, has worked with, has trained um, members, mostly youth members, to, um, to be able to be researchers, essentially, um, of, their, of their own right, and to um, lead both surveys and focus groups, interviews of, among themselves, among their membership, um, about the conditions of, of work in the industry, particularly among their membership who are uh, Filipino migrant workers. Um, and they did a six-year um, a six-year research project that was a truly a participatory action research project, not people posing and pretending they were whatnot and or coming in and sort of interviewing um, for, you know, for a minute, um, but really truly having that research come from the membership itself, right, from the workers themselves. Um, as well as the editorial process, all of the, from beginning to end, that report was really coming from the workers. And um, that is a phenomenal accomplishment. I just want to say that, that last night when I heard people asking, oh, are there, can, I'm looking for researchers, can we find researchers? The researchers are the workers. And what we need to do as coming from funding institutions, coming from academic institutions, what we need to do is to be able to facilitate that and then get out the way <laughs> and, and honor that, right? Um, so the, the culmination of that participatory research project uh, was a report called Doing the Work That Makes All Work Possible. 
Um, and they did that six-year research project alongside organizing this campaign uh, for Maranchu Baonan, um, who was one of the first trafficking victims who actually was able to um, have some justice against uh, the, uh, their traffickers, um, her, her trafficker, who, was, um, who were Filipino di diplomats. Um, and I think the astounding thing about that case, and, and most of the details of the settlement are not disclosable, um, and in my research and interviewing particularly attorneys around um, cases like this, what I understand is that um, the term is usually that the case was settled to the satisfaction of both parties. Well, I'm sure that it's just the, those, those uh, settlements are often probably as satisfying as my divorce settlement was, I'm guessing. Okay. Um, but I think that that is, that is utilized, that terminology is utilized often to protect the oppressor, right? To protect um, those who do not want to have their shit called out, right? Do not want to be um, called into the public as to how much they had to pay for, um, for the damage that they did. Um, at least we hope that's why. <laughs> that's why things are not being disclosed. Um, so that was a tremendous victory still, even though the settlement uh, terms were not disclosed, uh, because um, it was, they were able to overcome the diplomatic immunity that that, um, that, that diplomat employer slash trafficker um, wanted to be able to exercise. Um, finally, Linda Olakan, um, whom I interviewed um, many years ago, <laughs> and, then, um, and then we had the pleasure of sitting on a panel together at the first U.S. social forum uh, in Atlanta, right? Uh, and afterwards, uh, we talked, and she said, you know, you and I were saying the same thing, and we absolutely were. We were saying the same thing, and so when, when you said yesterday, um, you know, when you posed your question yesterday about capitalism and, and all of it, and Linda Burnham said, said thanks, Linda, for, for asking the big questions, um, you know, at the end. You know, I was thinking, well, you can answer that question just as easily as, as any of us in the room. I'm Linda Olikan of Damayan Migrant Workers Association. So I, I want to uh, comment on uh, what Rachel uh, reported or shared, right? that uh, what you see is uh, largely a sponsored migration. Yes. So uh, in our research that uh, Grace uh, mentioned, uh, it's, it, it's, it doesn't look that way. Many of the Filipino domestic workers here, you know, came as tourists, as family members, not as workers. And then they overstayed and decided to become domestic workers. So, so that's the difference. And so if you're interested in uh, doing your research, we will be uh, very happy to cooperate uh, to validate that. Uh, second, uh, last night I was uh, trying to connect the inherent exploitation and decay of capitalism to the rise of labor migration and domestic workers. Because uh, in our work, it is very clear, I'm also a domestic worker, that we came here not because we want to leave the Philippines. We, you know, uh, we have families there. We don't want to leave our children. We have, you know, professions back home. But many of the women, Filipino women that are here, are here because, you know, we're trying to find work. And uh, that is, uh, of course, connected to the underdevelopment, poverty, and un unemployment in the Philippines that are largely the, the results of uh, neoliberal uh, policies, right, of capitalism. So uh, I was trying to understand better if that, what is the, are the scholars validating that? That, you know, as capitalism becomes worst, right? Globally, there is a widespread uh, unemployment poverty causing, you know, uh, many <coughs> women, mostly mothers, to leave their homes in search of uh, jobs. And, you know, uh, increasing the number of this workforce and uh, shaping this industry. So that was my concern. Uh, last night. 
So uh, Linda and I were on a we're we're on a panel at the U.S. Social Forum. Uh, it was a panel about excluded workers, right? Um, and I think that um, what both of us talked about and what is very much focused upon in the um, in the report, doing the work that makes all work possible, um, is this phenomenon that you speak of, um, that you have spoken of, and that's very much uh, part of the report. Um, which is how does the Phil Philippine state, as a sending state, how does it actually facilitate the um, outmigration uh, of, of people, right? And in fact, encourage would be a nice soft uh, euphemistic word to use, um, but encourage um, that outmigration and then glorify that, um, what you all term, uh, what you all call the mortgaging of people's lives, right? Um, and I think that uh, other scholars that I um, respect who are, um, who are not here today, um, but who well could be, um, who also talk about this phenomenon are um, um, my friend Ana Guevara, um, uh, Robin Rodriguez, um, Catherine Sinisa Choi, all of these uh, scholars talk about the, the Philippine state and um, the role that is played in facilitating um, whatever you would like to call it, the outmigration or export of, of people. Yeah. Um, Saskia, did you want to add? Okay, yes, sure. Well, these were absolutely excellent comments, observations, and understandings and suggestions. I must say, it's very impressive. I just want to address two things very quickly. The last speaker, uh, Lydia? Linda. Linda, Linda. Linda. Uh, great for you, Gr great comments. Uh, it seems to me that when we use the term migration, today, I would say over the last 10 years or so, we really need to disassemble what we mean. Because for instance, if you consider just two elements, one environmental destruction, desertification, a lot of what we still call from our side, migrants or immigrants are expelled from livelihoods. Second little point in, in the global south, land grabs. In the last five years, 220 million hectares bought to make plantations mostly for biofuels. Eh? What does that mean? You evict rural communities, rural manufacturing districts, floras and faunas, of course. You flatten everything. Where do those people go? Well, first stop is the big megacities because the small towns won't take them because there's too much social control. Well, from there on, then to become migrants is not so far-fetched, right? Or to become subjects of traffickers or whatever, you know, friends who try to help you from another country. So then second, the st states, national governments, I won't talk about ours, though I could go on and on about it, but uh, many national states are truly glad to get rid of all kinds of their citizens. They do not want to deal. Nigeria builds a new capital. It's a private city, little mechanism. Everything is extremely expensive. They don't need to make a gated community. It's not visible, it's invisible. So when you look at what national governments in various parts of the world are doing, they are also pushing people out. So in my, sort of to, to summarize this now, in my view, much of what we call migration is really an expulsion for all kinds of reasons. And we've got to begin to deal with that as well. And I think we receiving countries, we also need to deal with that. We have recognized it in questions of war. Refugees, you know, is an established category, not much respected. We need to begin to, to confront that in other subjects as well. Singapore. Now, I like, I, I go quite a bit to Singapore. I'm one of their boards, uh, and I'm very active trying to promote a few new thingies. Singapore, like, mind you, many other countries, need new laws. And we need to get rid of a lot of old laws. I feel that about our country as well. <laughs> you know, we should not, a, a law is not some sort of godlike condition. We should eliminate a lot of existing laws that we have, and we need to make new laws. Now, who has made new laws? Who has created new rights? Corporations. And I've written a lot about that. So we know it can be done. Singapore is one of those countries where they're actually debating, at least in this board where I'm on, you know what? We really need, because you have a few lefties, believe it or not, in Singapore, we need to make new laws. 
we need certain things, we need certain types of workers, we need to recognize them and to make them rights-bearing subjects. So anyhow, I could go on and on, you can tell. But I just wanted to add that to these two very important points. Um, I want to add to the um, response of Saskia to the question of um, how do you um, mobilize migrant workers in places where civic engagement is not allowed, where countries are not liberal democracies, where there's no sense of a right of a person, but that it's really kind of collective bodies that are being represented by the state, um, and so Singapore being one of those countries. And so, um, and then I want to add to that then, it's like a problem is the workers who go to those destinations tend not to have the same kind of, come from the same demographics as the workers who come to the U.S. So the workers who sort of put themselves in these, you know, what I would say miserable situations are really the ones who come from like the poorest of the poor in the Philippines. They're the ones that are being displaced by land grabs. And so um, I think anyone familiar with the Philippines, for example, knows Basilan Island. No one would ever go there. It's like where the Abu Sayyaf, you know, the, the Al-Qaeda faction of the Philippines are. A lot of the people I interviewed in Dubai are from Basilan. I mean, they've invited me there and they said, you can wear our clothes so you can integrate. But I, I mean, I kind you know, softly like kind of uh, declined their invitation for me to visit their families because it's so dangerous there. But they were telling me, I mean, it's like they are like the extremely poor of the Philippines and they go to the UAE because they cannot buy, um, they cannot afford to buy a sack of rice. So then a lot of these people, you know, they, the question of how do you mobilize them? I mean, these individuals, are coming from places of extreme poverty that this miserable situation they find themselves in of servitude is a form of mobility for them. So it's like, you know, it's the unfreedom of poverty they're escaping for this unfreedom of servitude. And for them, that's like a step up. So how, you know, I wanna add that layer to this difficulty of organizing them. And so then, I mean, so then interestingly enough, in places like the Middle East, the biggest advocates for these individuals become the sending states they by default end up being the ones who try to implement labor standards for them that you see um, actually reach the consciousness of the workers. Um, and then another interesting thing too is that, um, so in Singapore, I mean, um, I, I think that see what, and I, someone really needs to look more into this, it's like um, the Convention 189, you really see trickling down this sort of sense of the dignity and human rights of domestic workers need to be recognized. You do see it trickling down in the discourse about domestic workers um, in Singapore and the UAE, and it's being used, for example, by um, TCW2, Transit Center Workers too, right, and, and how they mobilize um, domestic workers. And then what's really interesting is a lot of this information about human rights, the conventions, what their minimum wage are, circulate through Facebook, surprisingly. So a lot of the domestic workers who end up running away to go to these migrant centers because they were severely abused, in our interviews, we asked them, how did you know about this place? They said, oh, we found out through Facebook. Uh, and so then, it is, so then this knowledge does circulate um, among them. Is in response to the question about Singapore, one thing that I think we have done is misunderstood the purpose of laws. So I was working with the Department of State to try and put in additional protections for domestic workers trafficked by diplomats. And it came up in one of our meetings that Singapore was a model. And I thought, really? How is Singapore a model? Okay, so the way that Singapore was presented as a model was employers have to pay a bond mm -hmm. when they bring in a sponsored domestic worker. Mm -hmm. Now, it was our understanding that that bond, if the domestic worker were harmed in any mm -hmm. way, that the bond would then be sacrificed to the domestic worker as mm -hmm. a sort of compensation. No. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. That's not how it works. The bond is essentially to hold yeah. the employer responsible to make sure that the domestic worker does not abscond. Yeah. And yeah. if the domestic worker runs away, perhaps because the domestic worker is so horribly abused, the employer then gives up the bond to the state. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to be very careful about what we consider a model, and we need to be very careful yeah. about, <laughs> about pointing out where there is state complicity, yeah. right? That is complicity mm -hmm. in abuse, because people can't leave. Mm -hmm. When employers have a domestic worker who runs away, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, they hire people to hunt her down, mm -hmm. to find her, to bring her back. And I just wanted to briefly uh, 
talk about Massachusetts, and I'm so excited to hear what you're talking about because what it sounds like you have going on in Massachusetts, it's a three-tiered layering of um, this law being implemented, and I, and I like to see that. Um, two things I would suggest is um, making sure that in each of the state agencies, that one, they don't put it all back on you to organize um, how they're going to move forward. That's a danger zone, and they're doing that because uh, they understand that if they are able to say, okay, you handle all of the organizing of this, this implementation, they know that that's gonna be a burden for you and you won't be able to give full attention to each of the state agencies. So I would just suggest being a little bit cautious. And when we talk about strategies and so on moving forward, um, and this is gonna sound so gross, um, so capitalistic, <laughs> but honestly, they are looking for outcomes assessment. Get an economist or somebody who does quantoids. Yes, there he is, awesome. We, you get the quant, <laughs> together, get those numbers together. If you have the outcomes assessment, that is how you're going to push forward in getting people to recognize what it is that you're trying to do. That's the only way to get money through these agencies, really, is to show the outcomes assessment. And that goes for any state that we're talking about here. When we say, why is New York not, not at that level yet, we don't have a three-tiered system in, so, in this, the concrete way that Massachusetts seems to have, um, and I'm not that familiar or well-versed with what you have going on, but from what I'm hearing. Um, but I do think that you need to have those numbers put together because that, at the end of the day, is where the money is going to come from to support the effort that you're putting forth. If I can just add very briefly, in answer to your question on strategy, Linda, I really hope that it involves litigation. So I understand, I mean, my, my motto, I feel like Sarah Palin, sue baby, sue. Because, you know, the reality is that, you know, we're all aware, the work of the academic work of Jennifer Gordon, for example, points out in stark contrast how much tension there is between litigation and organizing, right? Lawyers say, this is all secret and confidential, and organizers say, tell your story in front of hundreds of people, right? So we have to figure out how to square that particular circle so that organizing and litigation are compatible but I do hope that all the strategies involve litigation because that's what raises the cost. Thank you. Um, Barbara Young. Um, and um, I was one of the people at the forefront of the new law in New York. And for many years, we uh, had the challenges of organizing the domestic workers here. One of the things that happened in New York, New York is just like the USA in the whole. There are many laws passed and very few in force. And, and we find that challenge in New York mm -hmm. with the enforcement of the, the bill that was passed. And um, we, are, we have since hired a state strategy organizer to look at and to, to work on what we can do to really get the enforcement of the new law and what additional laws that we can pass to help um, domestic workers. And like you um, were talking tomorrow about the, the fear of workers, and that fear is real. People living in New York is very expensive, and people are very fearful of losing their jobs. When you work as a, a domestic worker in New York, whether you're doing child care or elder care, and you have a job, you want to hold on to that job because your family welfare depends on that. Uh, today, you can have a home, apartment, and tomorrow you can be homeless in New York. So this fair is real for workers. And um, uh, Grace, when you talk, um, you spoke about agency and about the trafficking and we had to take it out of the, the bill. We had traffic victims here before. And um, there was a, a young woman that was brought by a diplomat um, from Congo and spoke French. And we had to find some person um, 
to translate for her. We find that person in Claire. Claire Hobden, she is part of this um, conference here. And, um, but we could not, we won that case against that diplomat uh, by doing what we do best, going to his place and, of work and his home and shaming him. Uh, but um, that could not be um, published. We couldn't publish um, the what um, she received because of some clause that was in the settlement. So there is a, there was a lot of trafficking going on. Uh, that we don't know about, and these are the ones that came forward that we were able to, to work on and to help. So hopefully this, con this um, convention coming up on Sunday with all the workers, we'll have um, a good uh, lot of material and a way to move forward with the organizing in New York. Thank you. Nisha, thank you for that comment because I have to say, for a long time, I was really the master of the incendiary narrative, right? That's what you are when you're a lawyer. You make your complaint as vibrant as possible. But that does sort of, that incendiary nature of the worst cases really does sort of obscure these things. Denise Brennan, who wrote a book called Life Interrupted about what happens to trafficking victims after they're trafficked, actually had to sort of educate me about this and, and educate me about the whole sort of continuum. So I think a lot of us have a long way to go. But in answer to your question of, where do we go, right? Where do we find the sort of continuum pro bono lawyers? One place is, you know, non-governmental organizations like the Equal Justice Center. So Agatha Tan, for example, is here from Washington, D.C., and did wage an hour work in the context of NGO organizing and also did trafficking work. So there are lawyers who can do, who can do both. Uh, secondly, where is the Department of Labor? Where are they? <laughs> And then my last comment is, it's, it's come up several times, this issue of confidentiality of settlements. Confidentiality of settlements can be freeing, actually, because in some cases, for the protection of my client, I want my client to be able to speak forever about what happened to her. I don't want a confidentiality clause that's a blanket that prevents her from speaking and organizing. But oftentimes, I do want a confidentiality clause that obscures the precise amount of money that she received because of the danger that puts her in. Danger of blackmail, danger of kidnapping. So frequently, we, we just have to see the other side of this as well, that winning the lottery or winning a lawsuit um, it can, can actually open you to dangers that might not be immediately obvious. Uh, just very quickly, on the law, I mean, in principle, of course, I agree with it that you need to implement, etc. But I do think that countries that have passed significant laws can make a difference, but the law by itself will not make the difference. Mm -hmm. You need mobilizing. And you mentioned 31 countries. Uruguay is a very good example. You need the leadership that goes there, but we really need to get rid of some old laws and we need to make some new laws. And, and by itself, it's not enough, but it is a first moment. Secondly, I also, I do, I do agree that we need to mobilize multiple you know, work with multiple other social movements. At the same time, everyone, this is a marker of the current moment across the world, that there is a real sort of disassembling of specialized movements, domestic workers, organizers, is that, because we're dealing with a very complex space and you need to navigate it. So the, the, the alliances very often, in my experience, are cutting across countries because you generate knowledge, you generate expertise, you know exactly what you need to make claims, you know, from your government, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a pattern that does not exclude, you know, working with others, but you need to develop knowledge and a kind of specialized understanding of what is up in the case of domestic workers. And I think you mentioned a whole range of issues that are particular and distinctive. So I do think that having these specialized movements that are fragments of larger needed mobilizations are an enormously important step. Otherwise, you fall in the hands of the leaders uh, mm -hmm. who supposedly know everything and they don't. <laughs> so, I want to thank you so much for everyone's participation today. I really appreciate it.